Welcome everybody to Verbum Day. Verbum Day is the lectionary podcast of Transcendent Truth Media. Let me pull up our text today. Uh, we're dealing with, uh, at the moment at least, sixth Sunday after Epiphany. And this is uh, Jeremiah 17, verse 5 through 10. That's our first text. So we begin here, thus says the Lord, cursed are those who trust in mere mortals. Now, this is, of course, in the context of, um, well, the broader context that Jeremiah is speaking to, and you can also see this through the rest of the prophets, but particularly um, in Jeremiah as the one who prophesies to the nations. And uh, a, lot of, a lot of this is really prophesying not just to the nations, but about the nations. And this is the whole problem here is that Israel has turned their face away from God and they have trusted in pagan kings to bring them merchandise, to make them rich, to make them powerful. They have wanted to from the very beginning. If you go back to um, those older texts of, of Judges and, and of Joshua, is that the people, and, and even First Samuel, right, the people wanted to be like the pagan nations. They wanted a king. They wanted chariots. They wanted horses. They didn't want to have to be the weak creature relying on the creator God. What they wanted is to have a might that starts from down below and goes upward. The ascent. They wanted to ascend to something. Whereas the strength, let's say, that Uh, Yahweh has always been trying to impress upon his people, has been a strength that is his, that is perfected in our weakness. It is our creatureliness relying upon his divine strength. That is what he has always desired as this perfect harmonious relationship between creator and creation. Whereas the religion of the law, the religion of the pagans, the religion of the nations has always been to have a strength that comes from within, from below and goes upward in a sense. It is, um, well, you could think of, yeah, that Greek myth of Sisyphus and the rock. Is that Sisyphus? I think it is. I could be wrong. But he's always trying to push that rock up the hill and he's never getting there, right? It's, 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 it's kind of like the, uh, what do you call those things? things people run on and they go nowhere treadmills right that is what the religion of the law is trying to do he's the cursed are you and that's the curse let me see actually sisyphus how do you spell sisyphus sisyphus walla this yeah sisyphus and the rock in it from homer's iliad yep and he's pushing the rock and you got all these graphs here i don't know if you guys can see what i'm looking at blah 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 founder of the king of the fifth something something and Zeus punished him for cheating death twice. Okay, really, this is all of it. This is all, this, this is it. This is the primordial truth. He's trying to cheat death twice. He's trying to cheat his mortality. He's trying to cheat his, uh, where, how do I get back to the Zoom thing? Here? Where are we? Here. He's trying to cheat his, you know, his creatureliness, his, his limit, his finality. And that is what, if you go to authors Gerhard Ferdy, if you go to Robert W. Jensen, if you go to who, whoever else, guys like this, Paulson, Stephen Paulson, you'll notice that the way that they're speaking of death is as you're accepting of finality, you're accepting of your own limitations, saying, I cannot do this, that is death, that's, a, you could say it's ego death, you could pull out a Tao Te Ching, you could pull out some of that, who's that weird, I, Alan Watts, I don't care what you do, but you need to understand that death here is meant to be the end. And so cursed are those who are trusting in mere mortals, in kings and strength from below, in kings and nations and horses and chariots. And then he goes on here and make mere flesh their strength, whose hearts turn away from the Lord. And again, here we were already talking a little bit about that. This is thing of the hearts that's important. Orange is for important. And then the turning away part. Right, and and you'll you'll recognize this turning away language. What what uh, listener turning away or turning to turning around? What is the word that this should uh, prompt our minds up here to be thinking of? Well, this is repentance. This is metanoia, right? Turning around, changing your mind, uh, whatever. And so, uh, we, I've added here a question mark because I assume some of you may be wondering. Well, and um, cursed are those who make flesh their strength. But what about the flesh of Christ? What about the humanity of Christ? What about this and that? Well, I've added a little sticky note here, right? Maybe you can see this. So what about Christ's flesh? 
Yes, it is still weakness. Um, and this is this is this is this gets to a whole other issue. Let me pull out a pen and start scribbling. I don't know why that would help me, but I feel like it will to explain this. You can't see the pen, by the way. This is solely for me, for the, the joy of scribbling, right? So so oh, I see here on my notepad, I have a note. I should make a note to keep this note and refer to this note later. This is my note to myself. Um, where was I going with this? Yes, the way that we understand the cross. So the, the cross, is the cross strength or is the cross weakness? You can also hear a lot of Catholics, Anglicans, Eastern Orthodox, not so much Eastern Orthodox. I think that they kind of mostly get this. But is that there's this group of people, I, I don't think that they're super wise. And they try to say that the cross is beautiful. That the cross is beauty itself. Now, I don't, I have a cross here, there, there, and here. I don't know if you can see any of them. Here's one, right? Is there anything particularly beautiful of a man who is nailed to a piece of wood and another piece of wood nailed together or however they're made? And is, he has nails through his wrists and his feet. Uh, uh, well, specifically with Christ, uh, a crown of thorns on his head. He's been brutal. The flesh on his back is torn right off. He's probably naked. Is there anything beautiful about this? No. And if you said that there was, you should probably be locked up in prison because you're not right in the head. Now, the thing, right, is, is that our, that's definitely not our beauty. That's not beautiful. But is, is there anything strong about it? No, no. And, and this is what something that people get uh, kind of mixed up where they talk about the cross, the cross as the death of death. And so they would say, well, the death of death, that's true. And I would say that's true too. And then they would say, well, because it's the death of death, this is our strong victory. This is the good victory. This is Christus Victor motif. He has had victory over death um, through the cross. Now that phrase is true because you said, now here's the key word, right? Through, through the cross. Now, does that mean that the cross is the strength? No, it doesn't. It means that you have to go through the cross to get to the strength. Because what is Christus Victor, if you know anything about it? What's it rooted in? It's rooted in the resurrection, not the cross. The cross is utter weakness. The cross is sheer weakness. The cross and the death of death is the death of death that happens through utter and complete death and weakness. And what were we talking about earlier that death is? It's the end. It's the creatureliness. It's the finitude. It's saying, I, I cannot go beyond this point. I am defeated, right? And so with Christ, we find that our defeat is taken upon by the one who didn't need to be defeated. Not that he couldn't be defeated. He let himself be defeated, right? So he, he can because he had let that happen. And so this is weakness he let himself be weak though he himself was strong and so the the even there we don't find and this, this is important because people would love to say well because christ was righteous his whole life through works of the flesh that when satan tried to attack him in the flesh he simply couldn't and christ had strong arm death by his death no christ was nailed to a cross and died there and then he was buried in a tomb and there's nothing strong about that. And, and you, this is especially becoming a problem with the way that folks like as Jordan Peterson becomes more and more popular among Christians is that his way of interpreting the scriptures, his way, let me blow up my face here. Cause I know, I know a lot of you love to see my beautiful, uh, disgusting face. Um, a, a lot of people are really drawn to the way that Peterson interprets and understands the text of scripture how he interprets and understands the cross. But if you go to the Lutheran, the theology of the cross, which is also utilized by a lot of unionist theologians, you could look at Mol uh, Jürgen Moltmann, you could look at Karl Barth, you could look at so on and so forth, is that and Peterson is trying to say, well, the cross, what you see there is a strength of integrity, a strength of character, where Jesus um, didn't need to take on our problems, the problems of the whole world, yet he did. And so for Peterson, he's saying, well, that's a great thing. That's a strong thing. And this is strength of integrity, strength of character, Peterson would say. But always, we may very well see that. But what I would, what I would simply say is this is that for all the strength and integrity that he may have, for all the strength and, and character that he may have, what he did was meet his end. 
truly. Uh, you may say, well, that's not truly the end. And, and here again, we get into the same concept that Peterson is trying to go with, is that the cross is made into this into this footnote uh, on the page of victory. But the cross is not the footnote on the page of victory. The cry of dereliction was truly real, as Gerhard Ferdi says. And uh, you, you simply cannot escape um, the despair that is at the cross, the, the crushing defeat that is at the cross. Now, all of this is a complete aside, except if it were not for um, the um, understanding that the salvation that I'm, I'm hovering over this, so you can see it, by the way, is that the, the, the understanding that the salvation that we have is not coming from flesh. It's not coming from his, um, his great might in his flesh, but it's coming from somewhere else. It's coming from grace. It's coming, it is coming indeed through loss and that it's a complete need to kill and have done away with this evil present age to usher in the new uh, coming future uh, eternal world, right? And you, you're we're going to see that in the epistle. We're going to see that in Luke 6. They shall be like a shrub in the desert. They shall not see re when relief comes, though relief is coming. They, so when relief comes, it is coming, but they will not see it. Why won't they see it? Because they're looking somewhere else. They're trying to look um, not only somewhere else, but for something else. So when it comes in the thing that they're looking at, they're going to say, that's not it. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus's disciples and all of the Jews around at the time was that his disciples and the people around Jesus's time, my beard looks so weird today, guys, is that they were looking for um, a military Messiah who would bring them military victory, material, temporary or temporal freedom from um, governmental oppression and so on and so forth. And they said, basically, how can you possibly be the Messiah? We're still oppressed by Rome. We're still this and we're still that. We're still poor. We're still, um, you know, downtrodden and lowly people. And you've not really done anything to save us from, from any of this. So. And they shall live in the parched places of the wilderness, in an un, un, uninhabited salt land. And bl blessed are those who trust in the Lord, whose trust is in the Lord. And again, we already spoke about this at the beginning, that we are to be living in this perfect um, relationship with God as creatures of the creator and his strength being perfected in our weakness and our looking to him. They shall be like a tree planted by water. Think here of Psalm 1 sending out its roots by the stream and it shall not fear when heat comes and when the leaves and its leaves shall stay green in the year of drought it is not anxious and it does not cease to bear fruit the heart is devious above all else it is perverse now let's make this orange why should we make this orange because we hear all the time i just heard it this last week i can't even tell you how many times this last week I hear it all the time, every, every week, every single week, tons of times, is people in matters of pastoral care, let's say pastoral care, okay, um, who receives the Eucharist, who does not receive the Eucharist, who is in the church, who is not in the church. Traditionally, we do this by confession of faith. But people will say, well, that's very well and good, but you don't know what's in their heart. Well, I don't need to know what's in their heart, because what's in their heart is deceitful above all else and perverse. So, uh, yeah, actually... Uh, I do know what's in their heart because the Bible says this in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse nine. I know that deceit is in their heart. I know that um, uh, perversion is in their heart. <laughs> Wickedness is in their heart. So next time someone says to you, you can't judge somebody because you don't know what's in their heart. Tell them, yes, I do, because the Lord has told me uh, who can understand what's in one's heart. Nobody. Um, and, and yet the Lord is the one who will test the mind. He will search the heart. He will. And that's terrifying. Uh, and people love to say, well, only God can judge me. He, he knows what's in my heart. Indeed, he does. And the scary thing is that that's exactly what he's going to judge. He's going to judge the thing that's um, uh, devious above all else. That's deceitful above all else. That's perverse above all else or below all else, you might say. He might, he's going to judge the dirtiest, stinkiest, grossest, vilest part of you, um, one that you can't get in there with a sponge to clean. And he will give all according to their ways, according to, well, what's in their heart. So that's one. To what they do in their ways. 
and to the fruit of the things that they do. So he's not only going to look at the stickiest, ugliest, grossest, vilest part of you, but he's going to look at the symptoms of that gross part of you. Um, Not only what's in your heart, which is evil, but the actions that come out of your heart, which is evil. And not only the actions, but the consequences and fruits of what you've done, which, let me tell you right now, are evil. You might not think that they are, um, because... Of course, we're always trying to self-justify and say, well, what I did, it's not really that bad. It's, it's not really a horrible. I, I'm really not, maybe not a good person, but an okay person. No, you're not. Uh, or you'll say, I'm not a murderer. Well, Jesus says, if you even hate your neighbor in your heart, if you're angry with your neighbor in your heart, you have murdered them in your heart. And so he, he's saying, yeah, in the eyes of the world, you're not a murderer, but in the eyes of God, you are. Um <laughs> <laughs> and and so we would even say, well, yeah, okay, well, maybe in the eyes of God, my actions aren't good, but in the eyes of the world, my actions are good. Well, God is not, uh, he doesn't care about the eyes of the world. He cares about his own eyes. And so he's going to look at what's in your heart, the things that come out of your heart, that come out of your mouth, uh, that uh, you, you do with your hands and the other members of your body. And then he's going to look at the fruit of those things. How did those affect the world? How did those affect other people's hearts? And um, see, this is, I, I've left a question mark here because I, I want us to ask and think about this. And I want us to, I put the sticky note here. You can see this, right? This is judgment of works. I, I want us to think about this throughout the week and as we get to Sunday, because as Lutherans, we can so easily, for some reason, look at a judgment based upon works and, and act as if it's not real or act as if like the law, because this is law, that it's not real, like a law don't real, you know? Um, but in reality, it is real. Now, there's something we have to be very careful about here because, well, as the law being what it is, it condemns. It's, it's not to say, yeah, um, I'm going to lower the standard here. And even though your heart is stinky and evil and gross and vile, and even your, though your actions are evil and stinky and gross and vile, and the effect that you had on the earth is, is only for bad, I'm going to and judge you as if you know you you did uh, you did okay no right and so every t- every single time we see these judgments by works and here is one of them is that this is to drive terror into your heart so i did this but now we're going to do this right this is this is judgment this is law and so uh, we're going to come here and meditate upon this reflect upon this the whole week hopefully that as he judges us he will find us guilty but as he judges us for the sake of christ uh as he judges us in Christ, as he judges Christ in us, we will be deemed innocent in spite of what we are by our hearts, by our hands, by our actions, and by our effects upon the world. Psalm 1. And now we don't only have to think about Psalm 1, but we can read it. We can even preach it if we want to. I've already preached this once in my life, so I'm probably not going to do that this Sunday. Maybe I will. I don't know. I haven't thought about it. But uh, there's two ways here, the NRSV says, two ways. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or take the paths that sinners tread, or sit in the seat of scoffers. But their delight is in the law of the Lord. And on this law, they meditate day and night. Let's stop here. Uh, Happy, blessed are those who, who do what? Who, who do as we do? Uh, No, I don't think so. Here's the thing, right? People would, if you look at the the description of, this is always funny to me. If you look at the description of the 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 person <laughs> in um, Psalm one, people would say, "Well, that's like some prudish Puritan, uh, holier than thou art." Listen to this, right? He does not follow the advice of the wicked. Who are the wicked? Pretty much everybody. If you wanted to limit it to only those outside of the church, you you can. There's some there's some biblical um, precedent to do that, but r- like really, if we wanted to take this really like narrowly, it's everybody. Broadly, it's everybody outside of the church. Either way, you are going to be seen as a holier than thou, prideful, uh, prudish, Puritan person that nobody likes. You don't take the path that sinners tread. You don't, you don't go with them to do their evil stuff. You don't listen to them. You don't hang out with them. You don't spend time with them. You don't sit in the seat of the scoffers. And this doesn't just mean that you are yourself scoffing, sit in the seat of like, do the office of it. It can mean that, but taken in this context, this is a triplet of you don't listen to them. You don't go with them. You don't sit with them, right? You don't hang out with them. You don't associate with them. 
And well, this isn't to say that, well, you'll see where this is going, right? Uh, but this person's delight is in the law of the Lord. It's, it's, in the, it's in the, we should understand this law way of the Lord. You can understand it strictly in um, regard to the law, but I, you wouldn't really get at the true meaning there. Um, and, and I've spoken about this a l- just a little bit, but it's always, a, it's always a good reminder to understand and remind ourselves that uh, the Hebrew authors of what we call the Old Testament were not really writing with, um, you know, it, it comes out in other ways. They, they were writing with a law gospel distinction, but they weren't using the kind of terminology that we were. And so when they're speaking of law or Torah, they're speaking of the way. And this is why Paul's language can often confuse New Testament not scholars. Scholars know what they're doing um, pro- when properly understood as scholars, but people who are studying the New Testament, students of the New Testament, and laity and, and pastors also, is when we're trying to understand how Paul is speaking of the law in Romans and Galatians, uh, it can get really complicated. Because on one hand, you'll have Paul saying, well, you're, you're justified by faith apart from works of the law, and the law, you're dead to the law, you don't need to do the works of the law, at least to be saved. And even if you're trying to save yourself by the law, and there he's speaking specifically of the Mosaic um, temple cult stuff, and the sacrifices, and the uh, circumcision, and the Sabbaths, and new moons, and feasts, and fasts, and all of this, is he's saying, even if you, even if you try to do that, even if you lump yourself in with that, you have to do the whole law to be saved and you are cut off from Christ and his cross. However, there's another uh, way that he uses that word where he talks about the law of Christ and the law of love. And so within, within the, the dynamic and paradigm of a law of gospel distinction, even one as sharp as I have, and I do believe I have a very sharp one, maybe not as sharp as some people, um, maybe not as sharp as Stephen Paulson or some others who completely distinguish any, well, this is another conversation. <laughs> I shouldn't get into that now, but is that even with a sharp distinction between law and gospel that many would call antinomian is that there is still a way in which this needs to be understand, understood as way rather than as law, because law itself, as we understand it, as Lutherans, is only command, is only the do, is only this and that, and that's included here as well. But also the, the thing that the, the Hebrews were understanding within law, not always, but a lot of the time, included also the gospel. So you could understand law or way, Torah, as law and gospel together. So their delight is not only in what God has said to do, but what God has done in the way of God. And, and this can also become very law <laughs> not, not, not to belabor the point, but when, when, we, when we have people who are talking about, you know, oh, I just want to follow, follow Jesus, or I'm a Jesus follower, I want to go the way of Jesus, or a follower of the way, uh, what, is, what, is, what is someone telling you if they're saying follow the way or follow me? They're saying, again, what did we say was the very narrow definition of law? It's do. And so this needs to be understood not as the law that God or the way that God is giving to us to follow, but the way that God has gone himself for us and for our sake. So there's, there's a narrow sense, there's a broad sense, there's a dynamic sense here. And that's what their delight is in. And um, on this law, they meditate day and night. And they're like trees planted by streams of water. Now, let me show you something, actually. Uh, I actually don't know how to show you this. Let me pull up a... Um, is the ESV going to do this for us? Here we go. Now, this is why... This is why... Um, I don't know why the NRSV did this, if it was because of uh, a friendliness and, and a trying to push against what's called uh, replacement theology, or if it's trying to push against um, a gendering of the text. This is a massive difference. Blessed is the man who does these things. He, his, him, right? Versus happy are those who, their, they, them. See the difference there? We're going to close this up now. We're done with this for today. Uh, (laughs) um, Right. He, who do we think we're talking about now? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the way, doesn't go with them, doesn't sit in their seat, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, both narrow and broad, both dynamic and strict. And on God's law, he, this man, meditates day and night. 
He is like a tree planted by streams of living water that yields its fruit in its season, and his leaf does not wither. And all that he does, he prospers. But the wicked are not so. Who did we say the wicked are? Who are the wicked? I'll let you think that one through. But they're like chaff that the wind drives away, right? Think of the, uh, he's coming in with his winnowing fork. I forget what week that was. It was not too long ago. Um, but he comes in, maybe that was baptism of the Lord or something. Yeah, so baptism of the Lord, which I haven't done that episode yet. I'm going to do that episode for Verbum Day, though. Uh, that's our last uh, retrospective episode, is that John the Baptist says, one is coming who is greater than me, who will baptize with fire and the spirit. And he will come in to like a threshing floor with his winnowing fork. And what he'll do is he'll sift through the wheat, right, with his winnowing fork. And the chaff will be blown away. And then he'll throw that in the, in the barn to be burned. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in, in the judgment. They'll die. That's what that means, right? They will not be able to withstand the judgment. Nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. And this is why I said there's a broad and a narrow sense to who the wicked are. Um, let that float over you. You can understand that both ways, because in truth, this is both dynamic. Uh, wicked is indeed all of us, and yet those in the church are considered the righteous. But why are we righteous? It's not because we are. It's because Christ is and because he is in us and we are in him. Uh, so for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, uh, but the way of the wicked will perish. And this is why. It's really under uh, important that we understand a connection here between, let's do this in yellow so we can, no, let's do it in blue so we can connect it. The law, can you guys see that right? The way, the law and the way, the law and the way, both in broad and narrow sense, again, broad and narrow sense, and uh, not just broad and narrow, but really what this gets down to is a dynamic sense. Now, I don't know, I usually like to tackle the epistle last, I don't know, maybe because I'm sick in the head, but let me just rip this off here so I can remember this note for later. Uh, so what's our gospel text? Our gospel text, this is, we're going to go back to the NRSV. Well, actually, let's keep the ESV open there and just at the side in case the uh, liberals try to do any funny business on us. So Jesus teaches and heals. This is Luke chapter 6. Verses 17 through 26, he came down with them and stood on a level place. This is the, uh, you've heard of the Sermon on the Mount? <laughs> okay, uh, this is the level place. This is either, this is either the uh, flat place on the Mount, we don't, there's debate upon this, or this is a different sermon altogether called the Sermon on the Plain. I like to think that they're the same one. That's just me. Um, he came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And they had come to hear him and to be healed of all their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for the power came out from him and healed all of them. That's very cool, isn't it? So he's preaching again. Jesus loves preaching. Uh, he is definitely a preacher. He loves uh, ear ministry and um, um, loves uh, telling the good news, you know. And so that's what he's doing again. You know what else he loves to do? He loves uh, curing uh, unclean spirits and healing diseases and all this stuff. And so, oh, I don't know what I opened there. Okay. And in the crowd, uh, they were trying to touch him for power came out from him. So even touching Jesus. His healing power, his divine majesty comes through him. Do any of you know, um, of course you do, if you're listening to Transcendent Truth Media, the Communicatio Idiomatum, the three gaineras. Go and look that up. Um, go and look at some of our podcasts on that. There's much. Uh, and then come back here and understand that even through his flesh, having been fully divinized by the incarnation, um, Though not always shown, not always exhibited. Here, of course, it is. And so even touching his uh, flesh, it is as if touching uh, the divine vivifying um, power of the flesh of God, uh, almost as if when you put a, an iron piece of metal or something in the fire, it becomes fireized. Uh, in a sense, and then it becomes hot, malleable, takes on some of the aspects of the fire, the heat 
uh, the the orange glow, and and all that stuff. But then he gets into really the meat of this text, and so this is really if 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 anyone is preaching on this text, they're not teaching on Jesus teaching and healing. They're not. But that is really important to where we're going with this. So keep this in your mind. Jesus is teaching and Jesus is healing. This is in the background of all of this. Then he says, blessed are you who are poor. Full, st full stop, right? I mean, it's not full stop because there's a comma, but conceptually full stop. In the context of healing people who are diseased, Casting out people who are possessed by demons. Put this in a modern context where we're not so much dealing with, I mean, we are dealing with diseases. I'm sure people are dealing with demonic possession, but even more so people are dealing with, I have COVID, I'm sick, I have cancer, I have Alzheimer's, I have whatever. Uh, I'm struggling with my sexuality. I have this problem and this, I'm going through a divorce. My son is dying, this and a financial collapse. And he says to the one, Right, so think of this. He says to the one who is in financial destitution, blessed are you who are poor. For yours is, 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 present tense, the kingdom of God. For yours is the kingdom of God. So what's really happening is, I really wish this wasn't red text, but it is. So let's deal with it anyways, because it looks horrible when you put colors over them. It's just ungodly. But... He's, he's speaking to the context that we think are evil, that we think are inherently bad, we don't want to be a part of. And then he says, blessed are you who are in that circumstance. So blessed are you who are poor. And, and there's this crazy, cra let's even unpurple un this. Uh, what is this? What am I doing here? How do you log us? I don't know. Actually, should we put this side by side with the ESV thing? No, that's weird. No, I don't like that. Let's unpurple this blessed. No, just the just the just unpurple that part. Let's make this green. Blood, good, right? Good for you who are suffering evil. For yours is right now the kingdom of God. This good news is for you. And this is really this is really the thing. Is it that is it that because they're poor, that means that they're blessed? No, no, not really. Um, but it's it's that the, there is a good news that has come. So people will take this and they'll run with it. They'll say this is the preferential option for the poor. No, it's not. Or they'll say this is to say that those who are poor have right now in their midst because of their poorness, this blessedness. Is that true? No, it's not. Right. But blessed are you who are poor for yours is the good news of God, the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now for you. And this you can really get the sense. Let's see if the ESV is doing the same thing, actually. How do I link these? Link set A. I should have gone with link set C. C for Connor, right? I know you, you guys like that one. No, don't get rid of this. What's this? I'm such a boomer. My goodness. No offense to the boomers. That's I, I shouldn't have used that. that was an insensitive joke. So um yeah, you really get a sense for the te for the tense here. Blessed are you who are for you will. Blessed are you who are hungry, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh, right? Blessed are you when people hate you and when they exclude you and, you rev and revile you and defame you on account of me, the son of man, not for your lack of subtlety and tact, but rejoice in that day and leap for joy, for you will be rewarded. Your reward is great in heaven. And if you go through the book of Matthew, this concept of reward is very extremely present, by the way. For that's what their ancestors did to the prophets. So all of this, all of this to put it simply in a word, as, as a word that would be preached, is that the, the context of the of the the teaching and the healing ministry of Jesus here is in the con is is really what to say. People, people and and tie this so you you want to conceptually tie this to Jeremiah 17. Cursed are you who um, boast in and trust in the strength of flesh 
in the strength of mere mortals and in and in mortal life also, right? So cursed are you. Let me put it this way. Cursed are you who think that your faith in Jesus and his good news is given so that you would feel good and be comfortable, that you would receive material healing, that you would receive a longer life, that you would receive material blessings. But blessed are those who trust in God to save them in their creaturely weakness because that is their strength. And that we need to understand that in light of the cross. We need to understand that in light of baptism and the word preached and, and all of this. And we need to understand this in context of 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, um, that the good news is, 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 is a stumbling block to Jews and, and a folly to the Gentiles. Right, that this gospel is insane. It looks weak. It looks humble. It looks like it can't save you, and 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 it looks like Jesus can't save us. And then even when it looks like He can save us in Luke six, when He's healing and He's casting out demons, He then says, "But this isn't the salvation. This isn't salvation. Physical healing isn't salvation." But blessed are you who are still diseased, for you will be healed. Right, and. We also really want to be careful here because the is and the tense, if we understand it as something that we have now fully, though we, we in a sense, we have some many things now fully, is that we really lose that actual blessed hope that we can look for and grasp of the greater eternity that's coming for us. Imagine if I said to someone who is poor, blessed are you who are poor because that's how God wants you to live for eternity. <laughs> Or blessed are you who are dealing with leukemia because that's like that's that's how you're supposed to be. It's not. We know that something is fundamentally wrong with the present circumstance. We all deep down know that it is wrong. It is fundamentally wrong that we are sinning. It is fundamentally wrong that we're suffering. It is fundamentally wrong that there is injustice in this world. And there is a day coming where Jesus Christ will rectify that and all things that have gone wrong because of our faults, because of our own faults, because of our own most grievous faults. And He is going to right all of our wrongs. And though everything is so wrong, he's going to right everything, uh, even your own heart, even your own self, that you will be killed and raised up. You will die and be risen to new life. And so blessed are you who weep now, for you will laugh. And that is a future tense present. Or no, I didn't. What did I just say? That is future tense, right? Uh, for yours is the kingdom of God. For yours is the preaching of the good news. For yours is the good news right now. And the good news is what? That you will be filled, that you will laugh, right? That you will be received. And that those who are treated well in this life, he says, right? That's not always such a good thing. But you're what you you want to, and this is really this is really a math. What's the word? Matthean? Matthewan? I don't know. This is really a concept that's heavy in the Gospel of Matthew, in those first twenty chapters. There is the concept of the reward here from doing the law, from doing good works, from civil righteousness, or even righteousness, yeah, uh, not like a theological kind of uh, virtue ethic before other people, versus the kind of reward that you get. Uh, from Christ. And this is not to say like this is a re reward for your works, but it is something to think about. How do we understand that reward? Is that reward salvation or is that some kind of reward apart from salvation? Um, there's debates there. Um, I'm sure if you've listened to me enough, you know where I stand on the matter. But woe to you who are rich. And here's the thing, right? And th th we spoke about this. We've spoken about a lot of things. I don't know how recent it was, but there was the good news of um, the Magnificat, that he will come and raise up the humble, but lower um, the mighty. And I, I spoke about this as the gospel, like the good news, but it's also the bad news, but also ultimately the good news. That's confusing, I know, um, of the gospel of reversal, of reversal, is that to the one who is lowly, you'll be risen up, but to the one who is risen up, you will be lowered. And so no matter how you hear it, you're going to have to come back and say, well, this actually can't be about me. This has to actually be about the eternal one, about Christ Jesus. And this is very similar. Blessed are you who are uh, poor. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who are weeping. Blessed are you who are hated, who are excluded, who are reviled, who are defamed. Right? For you will be filled you will laugh 
you will leap for joy, you will be rewarded. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation now. What's the implication, right? You will receive nothing later. And, and it goes even further in verse 25. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. You will suffer that. Woe to you who are laughing now. Again, it does the same as verse 25. For you will mourn and weep. It doesn't say, for you have had your laughter now. No, you will have your suffering. You will have that. You will be lowered. This is, a, this is the Magnificat. Woe to you uh, to when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. And what ultimately happened to the false prophets? Nothing good. Nothing good. So let's end here with our, our epistle reading. Because it's actually, it is the epistle reading that anchors us down and finishes all that's been said, right? Don't trust in the strength of flesh. Don't trust in the strength of this and of that and, and of mortals. Don't believe that the gospel is about um, healing your crooked toe or your short leg that needs to be lengthened. You know what I'm talking about. All of this charlatan, charismatic healing nonsense. None of that is the gospel. None of that is Christ's salvation of you. Um, and this gospel of reversal, it, it says that, it says, I, I shouldn't say it says, but it leads us to realize that that salvation, that ultimate fulfilling of all of these things of the raising, of the lowering, it has to ultimately happen in a final complete death and resurrection. And that's why I started where I started um, speaking about death and Sisyphus in Jeremiah 17. And why it was necessary to understand Psalm 1, not as plural, but as singular. <clears throat> so we read here, this is verse 12 through 20. This is the great funeral text, the great resurrection text. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, right? Raised from the dead, that's new life. How can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? And if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ can't be raised. And if Christ has not been raised, this is important. Christ has not been raised. Then our proclamation has been in vain and your faith has been in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified of God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised. But if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. Right? If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. So, extremely important. What, what frees us from sin? And the adverse, is that the right word? The adverse, the converse, the other side of this, is that if he is not raised, you're still in your sins. And so his resurrection is what frees us from sins. It's not, so, and that's why I said, the death of death is at the cross, but the Christus victory, the victory of Christ is in the, what? Resurrection. Uh, so if Christ is raised, you are freed from your sins. That's an objective gospel. That's a universal truth for those who hate universal truths. This is one. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.19, and Christ God has been, has reconciled the whole world in Christ. To himself in Christ, in Christ himself, however you want to render that. But if Christ has not been raised, then he has not reconciled anything to himself, and you are still going to die in your sins, regardless of what you believe. And then those also who have died in Christ have perished. It, if for this life only we have hope for in Christ, we are of people to be most pitied. Of course, that's true, right? Because we're not only living. We would not only would we be living in, in a false hope, but we would be living, you know, a, a lot of people super ethically, and we could be eating and drinking and being merry and, and indulging in all of these sins that um, make pleased the flesh. Because I know a lot of people like Pascal's wager, is this Pascal? These types of guys who are like, well, following the Christian life and the virtuous life is the most pleasurable life. Let me tell you, that's not true. Um, <laughs> it's not true. There are a lot of things that we would like to be doing, which we should not be doing and simply not doing them will not give you uh, the kind of fleshly enjoyment. It will, it will be stored up later for you. Um, that, that is how this works. That is what Matthew has been speaking about. That's what Luke has been speaking about. That is all of these things 
is that, um, yeah, a lot of the things that people do are pleasurable. The, the easy fixes, we know that they give us pleasure in the here and now, but they're fleeting. And so that, that's the whole thing. It's just on a, on, a, on a grander scale. This isn't to say, this isn't to say that you will not in the long run from the virtuous life have a happier eternity. But it is to say, just as with the, the shorter scheme of things, if you do all the things that are pleasurable in the here and now, but not in the long term, um, really, that's what your life will look like in a grander scale. Right. So if, if you're if you're if you're living in a fleshly pleasing way. In a grander scale, it is much more pleasing in this life to live that way than this way. And what is this way? This way is the way of the law. This is the way of living the way that your neighbor needs you to live. Not stealing, not killing, not um, committing adultery, not lusting, not fornicating, not doing drugs, not drinking too much. Um, and of course, we don't live up to all of these things ever. But is that if we were to say, well, how can I get the most enjoyment out of life? Paul is not telling you it's the stoic way. He's not telling you it's the virtuous way. He's really not. So he goes on here. But in fact, this is the last verse. If Christ has been raised from the dead. No, not if, but he says, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. The first fruits of those who have died. And do we continue on here with verse 21 next week? Let's see. No, we don't. So let's look at that. Let's look at what that has to say for us right now. For since death came through a human being and the resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ. This is really important because it anchors all that he's saying down to that universal objective. Though, um, um, then comes the end, right? When the hands of the kingdom, when he hands over the kingdom to the father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and every power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death, which how was that destroyed? In his death, um, for God has put all things under subjection under his feet. Now this, read this, let's put this in yellow so I can match it up for you guys. Um, 25 and 27. These are the same thing. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. For God has put all enemies under his feet. When it says all things are put in subjection, it is plain that this does not include the one who has put all things in subjection under him. When all things are subjected to him, then the son himself will also be subjected to the one who put all things under subjected under him so that God may be all in all. Now, I think when we come back here, we're picking up at verse 35. So we're skipping a lot of this, right? So if you wanted to do anything with this, I'd say do it, right? Um, it's really difficult. Don't, don't try and do anything if you're preaching this. Maybe if you're just trying to understand it with the baptism of the dead. Um, that is really, we're not really even sure what that means. Um, we being scholars, not that I'm one of them, but we as the church collectively. Uh, we haven't really decided what we think that means. Uh, don't really even have multiple opinions, kind of just scratching our heads at that. Um, but, but he goes on, why are we putting ourselves in danger every hour? I die every day. That is as certain brothers and sisters as my boasting of you, a boast that I make in Christ our Lord. If I merely have human hopes, I fought with wild animals at Ephesus, what would I have gained by it if the dead are not raised? And this is why I say he's not saying the most pleasurable way to live is the stoic way. It's not the virtuous life, right? He says, if the dead are not raised, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And I think we all understand uh, the uh, subtle implications he's making here, right? But he says, do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Come to a sober and right mind and sin no more. And this connect this here with that, right? with uh, eating and drinking for tomorrow we die. He's saying, just go and sin as much as you want. That's how you're going to get the most enjoyment out of this life. But if this isn't all that there is, and if what you do really matters, and, and, if, and if, well, the implications are even broader here, right? Because this gets into that whole, how can we sin that grace may abound? And what is the one who is continuing in sin doing and all of this? And how do works factor into that final equation? 
at the end of the day, not that salvation is math, not that we're going to be judged by works in the end. Maybe we are. And it's, it's all this stuff. And I mean, you know, where I stand on the matter. We are not just by works. They don't impact our salvation at all, but I'm just saying what, this is the way that the text needs to be understood the way that we need to understand how those in the pews are understanding um, the text simply as it hits them in their ears. Right. For some people have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. <laughs> and uh, maybe you could leave it there, right? Because we just came off on Luke 5, 1 to 11, evangelism. Um, you know what? If you wanted to end with a lie, never say to this. This is always a bad idea. But if you wanted to, come to a sober and right mind. Sin no more. For some people haven't even heard of God. And I say that to your shame because you haven't been out preaching the gospel. And that's that's... <laughs> <laughs> That's one heck of a way to end things, Paul. Anyways, God bless you and thank you for joining me for the sixth Sunday after Epiphany. And I hope uh, all you are all um, forgiven of your sin on Sunday, refreshed, rejuvenated, renewed, so on and so forth this Lord's Day. And God bless you all. <laughs>